And we are here this morning because God wants us to be here. And don't think of someone that is not here. Just think of yourself and the Lord. And you will help us solve through this morning. Thank you so much for coming and for your effort. Mr. Ray, always good to see you. And our beloved uh, pastor who gave us his place. We appreciate your effort and your time, Pastor Aaron. Well, you ask yourself this morning, what do I find the Lord to accomplish in my life this morning? What do you want to receive from the Lord? The Bible says, this are recorded to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. For his compassions fell not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Amen. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he shall give to you the desires of your heart. Amen. Commit your way to the Lord, and trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Amen. And do not lean to your own human understanding. Amen. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good, Amen. to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. All scripture is God's breed. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that a man of God might be matured and furnished unto all good works. Cast your body upon him, and he will sustain you. He will never suffer the righteous to be moved. I have been young, but now I'm old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken. Or his children make him pray. Let us pray. Father, we are grateful and humbled to be in your presence this morning. Father, we have come to feed on your table. We have opened our mouths so wide. Feed us in Christ's name. Amen. As we go through comfort and suffering this morning and the I have uh, two portions, the first one and then the next one after break. There are three things that I, I would want us to just engrave in our hearts. Three things that will enable us to suffer through the waves of suffering with great ease peace and joy. Three things that we need to put in, engrave, just engrave them, those three things. If you engrave them, I promise you, you will suffer through the suffering of this life with great peace and joy. The first thing is to know who you are. Who are you? Who you are in Christ? Your position in Christ. That is the first thing. You are a child of God. You have been purchased with the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Some time ago, we went to visit the, the church, and the, his, uh, the pastor of the wife gave my wife a gift, a token, and it was a, a gold, an ounce of gold. You know the cost, probably in US dollars at that time, maybe $1,400 as a gift. That's precious metal. But you just think that he, she will grab it and give it to her and say, okay, that's for you. No, it was put in a 
something wrapped, another layer wrapped, another thing, and a nice pie. Wow, just to get to eat. You have to dig, and that's, that tells you how this is not just something you pick up, it's not a stone, it's something precious. The moment you are purchased as God's own possession, He not only wrapped you as His child, but He goes a step further, and that's you. You trust in Christ. The moment you trust in Christ, God takes you by the ministry of the Holy Spirit and puts you in His arm. That's where you are, hidden in Christ. And because Christ is so precious to the Father, He puts Him inside Himself. That's what the Bible tells me in Colossians chapter 3. You are hidden in Christ and Christ in God. See how precious you are. Nobody can see you. To see you to first you must first see God and then see Christ and then finally you. You are the, in the inner cycle. You are the, in the inner cycle. Who you are in Christ will help you understand suffering. It will help you to go through suffering with flying colors. The second thing that you need to understand is God. Who is God? Many a times we fret under suffering. Many a times we panic when we go through suffering simply because we do not understand who God is. Even though we claim to know God, we claim to worship Him, we claim to praise Him, but in reality we don't know Him. Daniel said, those who know their God. That means not everybody knows their God. Amen. Those who know. There are things we as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ take for granted. We just go along thinking that we know what we should know. You see, sometimes when we read scripture, we read it in a hurry that we don't pay attention. For example, in Romans 8, 28, For God causes all things to work together for good to them. Exactly that word, them. It is said to every believer. To them that love God. And not every believer loves God. You say, don't say that. We all love God. Not according to my Bible. The Bible says, if you love me, do what I command you. And I cannot tell you that not everybody is doing what God commands. Knowing who God is, that God is a caring God, a faithful God, a loving God, a God who keeps his promises. He's omnipotent. Omnipresent, omniscient. We say all this word so casually. God is omnipotent. He's all powerful. When something that shows you about power comes, you think that the person will overcome him. God is omnipotent. That means all powerful. Nothing can come between him and his promise. It's all powerful. That, that means he has the power to deliver the promise he has made. You see, I can make you a promise. A promise is not strong as the person who makes it. I can make you a promise. And you know me that I keep my word. I'm just a woman. But there comes a time when 
my humanity will show. Let's assume that I, for, for many years, I have been borrowing money from you, and I have been faithful in returning that money back to you. All of a sudden, I come to you and I need, need 10,000 pounds. You say, that's easy. No problem. <laughs> if I, I can go to pay trust in you, and I get 10,000 pounds, I say, I will bring it to you next month. And next month comes around, I get laid off from my work. And not only that, my investment, my stock, whatever I put money, <laughs> gone. And now, no money in the bank, no investment, no job, and one month came around, comes around, and it starts crashing my head. I look at you, my sister said, <laughs> give me two more weeks. Two more weeks comes out, to give me two more years. Where's my 10,000 pounds? The story is changing every day. See, I'm a human. Something has fallen down under me, beyond my power, beyond my control. When there's nothing beyond God's control. So that whatever God promises, He will deliver. Because He's omnipotent. God is omniscient. That means He knows all the knowables. There is nothing God doesn't know. He knows everything about you. He knows all your problems before they occur. He knows we are going and they are coming out. God knows everything. There is no accident in God's program. And there is no good luck either. Good luck means that God somehow was sleeping and then something falls off his head and comes to you. That's good luck. So as far as that, we know, God does not sleep. He's omnipresent. That means he is not far away looking at you with your problem. He is there because he's omnipresent. Yeah. Often, something, often we, we, we show how much we know about God. When we come to a church, we pray and say, God, come to our come to our knees. That's a joke. Yeah. That shows you don't know him as you should. God is there before you came. Yes, amen. He was ahead of you because he's everywhere. David said, Where can I go away from your presence? Amen. So if God is already there, why call you to come? <laughs> come in our midst. Who's midst? He was there before you entered. <laughs> the third thing is to know why you are here. To know why you are here. That is the third thing that you need to engrave in your heart. To know why you are here. Why are you here? For God's glory. You are here for the praise of His glory. If you, honestly speak, if you grasp this three things, you can say, well, since I got it, can we go and eat lunch and go home? If you grasp these things, three things as a believer, it will change the way you look at suffering. If you understand that God is omnipotent, if you understand that God is in control of everything, He's in control. God is in control of your circumstances. Your circumstances are not in control. If you know that, I have nothing to be afraid of. He's in control of your circumstance. Often we think that circumstances are in control. No, 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 it's God. Amen. If we grasp that truth, if we know that even before something comes to you, God has already tested it. 
and he knows the outcome. And if you know the reason why you are here, that you are here for the praise of his glory, you are here, then you can begin to relate to your suffering with it. If God knows, so whatever comes to me, he must have allowed it for a purpose, for the praise of his glory. That's how Paul lived his life. In prison, he didn't complain because he knew he was here on the planet of not for his own praise, not for his own recognition, but for the praise of God's glory. So if that glory will take him to prison, he rejoiced in prison. Amen. Because his aim was to glorify God. For me, living Christ, dying, prophet. All I need is Christ. All my focus was for his praise. So whatever he takes, it takes my back to be ripped into pieces, so be it. That's why in jail, having been ripped in pieces indeed, he was singing praises. Amen. Even in pain. That's a big combination to sing while we are bleeding. It takes a man who knew why he was here on the planet Earth to sing while in pain. Those three things, keep them in mind. As we begin, you see, see yourself as a patient. I, I had experience of being in the hospital for several years. Actually, I, I was in the renal department, renal kidney, where some people, their kidneys give up, they don't work anymore. You see a beautiful young lady, the kidneys are not up there anymore. You see a handsome young man, the kidneys are not there anymore. They can use regular bathroom like other people do. You see people who are suffering diabetes. One beautiful young lady I saw, the picture remained in me to this very day. Very young, with her two hands were amputated. It, it said, that's, oh, you say, oh, not so fast. Her two legs were equally amputated. No legs, no hands. Just lying on the bed like a football. He was suffering from diabetes, by flow of the world. But we have also seen some people who are going through this illness and doctors will prescribe them what to do, foods to avoid, don't eat this, wash this, wash that, wash this, wash that. I was a man that every morning I probably estimate he would put about 50 pills in the mouth. He has a big box of pills, compartments. But he was following the prescription of a doctor. And many people, after having been prescribed what to do, we go home. After a day or two, they just go back to their good life. Don't smoke. Ah, after a while, they go back. Don't eat too much of this, salt or this. After a while, they start going back to McDonald's. They can that the taste of McDonald's. Destroying them back again. And after a month, they'll come back to the hospital with the same problem back again. 
What's the problem? They have been prescribed what to do. They are not doing it. And so see yourself this morning as a patient. You are a patient of God. And see me as a doctor. A doctor of the Lord. Standing here, giving you prescription to take that will help you soft through the waves of suffering with great peace. I know my God, as Paul would say, suffering by definition is anything that brings discomforts to the soul. Anything that brings discomforts to the soul is suffering. See, I have an idea. Before you, you don't just see somebody and begin to prescribe medicine. You have to, first of all, find out what's wrong with the person. You have to, that's why you see them send you to x-ray. Do, do, if you complain that heart, go have a uh, uh, EKG. You complain about this. They, they want to get all the information and identify the problem. So if you have come here this morning and say, well, sis, just give me the formula that will help with the suffering of this life. Not so fast. We must first of all identify what's the problem, what's suffering. Where is it coming from? Because if I keep prescribing and prescribing and prescribing, just easy way out, easy way out, and you don't know the root. You don't know where the cause is coming from. You keep cycling, cycling, and never have freedom in Christ. Amen. And that's why we must identify suffering. Suffering encompasses general problems of mankind, such as maladjustment in marriage. Your loved one died. Loneliness. Stress. Poverty. You are very poor. Suffering. Wars around us. Generate suffering. Discrimination. Self-induced misery, divine discipline, just to name a few. Point of truth. Point of truth. Every suffering in life has its origin from one of three sources. I hope you're writing something down, unless you are learning by osmosis. Every suffering in life has its source, its origin from one of three sources. One, living in a fallen world. Living in a fallen world. We suffer because the world is already broken. The world has been shattered by sin. This is a broken world. Nothing is it's no longer perfect the world that God made. Because of broken world, we have wars. Even the wars that are happening now affects everyone in this country. We suffer big, if, for example, if there's a it's, it's war in Iraq or in Iran and other places, I can tell you, those of you who have come with automobiles, you probably will get 20 pounds a liter. That's suffering when you don't make probably 200 pounds a week. Suffering because we are in a fallen world. Two, 
Another source of suffering is self. 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 I can tell you that more than 90% of suffering that we as Christians go through are self manufactured. They are self manufactured, self made, self induced. If we can eliminate 80 85% of our suffering because we are the manufacturer, I can tell you we will have less suffering in life. Because most of the suffering are made by us and labeled, made by me. I'm the manufacturer. Because we make bad decisions, we do not have. The Bible tells us, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Your word have I spoken in my soul that I may not sin against you. We don't have the word of God as a lamp, as a light. Therefore, we stumble in darkness, hitting our foot on every stone of bad decision. Because if we don't see light, we don't have light. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Many people, many believers, stay away from the world. They read the word like uh, Easter, Easter service, or Christmas, when everybody gathers. And that's the time they are able to look at the world. When you have the world guiding your thoughts, bad decisions are diminished or minimized. The third source is God. And suffering from God is breaking down into two categories. Suffering from God is breaking down into two categories. Number one, divine discipline. Divine discipline. See, the reason why I'm putting all these things down is as you write them down, as you check within you, as you go into your soul to identify the source of what problem you may be going in life or I may be going in life. Once I identify it, then I'm looking for the solution. And once I do what the God wants me to do as a doctor, he is the doctor of doctors, by the way, the great physician. As he tells us what to do, when we do it, we will have a big smile on our faces. Define discipline. Second Chronicles 15. Second Chronicles 15, verse 3. He says, for many days or many years, rather, Israel was without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Israel was without a teaching priest. They were without God and without law. Now, that's obvious. To know God is to know his word. To love God is to know him. Apart from his word, you cannot know God. And when you don't have his word, you will soon forget him. Because God and his word are connected. And when we are moved away from him, when we forget him, because we are his children, he doesn't look the other way and say, oh, okay, go on your way. No, he's gonna he's gonna bring us back to a place where he will bless us. Because God wants to bless us. He is teaching to bless us. And what will God do to get our attention? He will discipline us. Good answer. Look at verse 5. And in those times there was no peace to him who went out or to him who came in. For many disturbances afflicted all the inhabitants of the land. Many disturbances, no peace. Just as we experience it today. 
when you have no peace, isn't that suffering? Suffering is that opposite of that peace. No peace. We don't have peace in America. We don't have peace. I don't, I don't know where you have peace now. There's no place. For God, then you ask me, okay, Moses, how is it God doing? The next verse tells you. Verse 6. And nation was crushed by nation and city by city. For God troubled them with every kind of distress. So don't blame Satan. Often we tell Satan, we blame Satan for what he must do. If we believe that God is omnipotent, then God said, give me the credit. I troubled them with every kind of distress. Every kind. That means any type of distress you're thinking about, God said, I manufacture, I troubled them with that distress too. Every kind. And that's suffering. You see, how does the suffering come about? From God. Because they abandoned him. When we as believers abandon God, we are begging for suffering. And I can't, nobody can give you prescription that we just whew, walk that way. There's only one solution. If we talk back to God, He takes away the suffering. Look at verse 4. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought Him. And he let them find him. That's amazing grace. They moved away. He brought suffering. In their difficulties, in their suffering, they turned back to him. He welcomed them back. That's our God. A gracious God. The second suffering that comes from God, number two, is suffering for blessing. Suffering for blessing. James 1, 2 through 4. James 1, verses 2 through 4. James, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was first hand witness of what his brother went through as the son of God wrote to the believers who were going through suffering. Verse 2, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In the second section, we're going to analyze what, I, what, I, what I'm just breaking down here. <coughs> James said, consider it job. When you are going through famous trials in your life, well, before you consider it joy, be sure that it's not the one you manufacture. Check, check the suffering. Am I the, am, am, is it the one I manufacture? If you are the one that manufactured it, don't rejoice. Don't enjoy it then. Do, in other words, you need to get back to what they did in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 4. Turn back to God, and He will welcome you back. But if you have looked like Job looked in his life, he, he has no connection to the suffering. He couldn't understand why he was going through what he was going through because inside of him he knew himself. He knew that his life was pure before God. In fact, God gave him that credit that there was no man like him in Job chapter 1. In other words, you, you, and I, you and I, you and me, we know what we ate this morning, don't we? We know what we ate before coming here. 
The same way, when we go through suffering, we will, if you tell me that I don't really know the source of my suffering, you are deceiving yourself. As a believer who is watching his, his life or her life every day, you will be able to know whether you have been walking with the Lord. If you have been doing dubious one foot with the Lord, one foot with your Lord, you will know too. If you are doing a multi-business with the Lord, you will know too. But if you know within yourself that you are living according to the plan of God for your life, under the mentorship of the Holy Spirit, you are walking in the light as God is in the light. And suffering comes. You smile. Knowing that God is up to something. He's about to build you for a magnificent blessing. God is about to build you with great capacity to bless you in this life beyond your imagination. That's what James said, consider your job. See, God must first prepare you with capacity before he blesses you. So anything with that capacity is a disaster, it's a recipe for disaster. Marriage with that capacity is a recipe for disaster. Blessing or money well with that capacity is a recipe for disaster. There are people today, if you give them more money, you destroy them. There are people today, if you give them, they have five million pounds, you finish them. They won't be in church anymore. They will not be in the church. <laughs> they will be in the US, in Australia. They book a ticket, booking hotel, booking first class, everything. They change. New cars. They try to find the place where rich people live. That's where they're going to buy the next house. They change their hair. Change everything. If possible, they bleach themselves. Why money? They get money. You see them, you won't even recognize them anymore. Or if you recognize them, say, Brother, I haven't seen you for a while. Oh, I'm with you in the spirit. <laughs> I have been with you in the spirit. With his travel. See, the money has put in my way. From God. What's the problem? He doesn't have capacity for that money. See, the money has become more important to him than the giver. Amen. That's immaturity. When the giver is more important than the gift to you, that shows you are growing in Christ. So that's what James says count it job. Hebrews 5 verse 8. Hebrews 5 verse 8. You see, we must first of all clear the thoughts. We must clear the thoughts that people have given us wrong misinformation. Some have told us, no, suffering is not for believers. If you are suffering, that means, brother, sister, check your life. Where did they get that idea from? It's not in the Bible. It's not being a joke so far, but he didn't do anything. In fact, his friends got into trouble for har harassment. They were harassing a righteous man. When the, when the story, when the whole thing was over, God called him to his courtroom. And by not for the grace of God, he would have killed him. Nobody, suffering is part of our spiritual heritage. Suffering is part of Christian heritage. See, you see some, you hear some, some preachers, they tell you, come to Christ, believe in Him, all your sufferings will be wiped out. That's a wrong message. Come to Christ, your suffering will be multiplied. But he will give you the power to sustain. Amen. That's the difference. 
whether they will be removed is not in scripture. Paul said, well, it's for you to believe in Christ and also to suffer. Jesus Christ was perfect example of one who suffered. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. He was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. He's talking about Jesus Christ. The author of Hebrew called our attention to the person he was writing to. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. In other words, through obedience, through suffering, God brought his son to the level of obedience he desired. Verse 9. And having been made perfect, the level doesn't mean perfection in the sense that he was sin, sin, sinful and then he, God changed him. Have, having been made perfect means having been made mature. Because Christ moved in his human nature, he moved from his babyhood to adolescence to maturity. God did not use him until he was mature. And that's what Hebrew is telling us. Having been made mature or perfect, he became for us a source of salvation. Suffering in relation to worry, anxiety, and depression. Physicians have now labeled worry a disease. Dr. James W. Barton made this comment recently. Quote, it is known that about one half of the patients consulting a physician have no organic disease. In about one fourth of the cases, the cause of the symptoms is tenseness or worry, strain and fatigue, prolonged shock or fear, which is really worry, can affect the workings of all the organs of the body. End of quote. Dr. Ba Dr. Barton discovered this amazing fact just recently. But scripture unveiled the truth long ago. Proverbs 17, 22. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit dries up the bones. See, the doctor, but he just said what worry can do. And the Proverbs already showed us what worry and broken spirit can do to your health. It dries up the bone. Proverbs 12, verse 25. Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down. Anxiety in the heart of a man weighs it down. In other words, Anxiety in your heart makes your body sick. The World Health Organization ranked depression the third most prevalent, moderate, and severe disabling malady globally. And here in the UK, according to Office for Natural Statistics, ONS, Anxiety or depression affect one in every five UK adults. Result of depression, persistent sadness, loss of interest, fatigue, or loss of energy, guilt, decreased inability to think, insomnia. Dr. Han Sal, in his writing on disease theory said, stress is the trigger which causes disease. Another doctor, Avarice, agrees. He says, worry is the cause of most stomach disease. 
No wonder why our Savior exhausts believers in Matthew 6.25. Do not be anxious for life. You see, he sees all these things ahead of time, knowing what they can do to our body. See, God has given us a body to be used for his glory. But we can destroy it through worry, anxiety, depression. Worry is a sin. And sin is anything that sin is disobedience. The Apostle Paul used the strongest command in Philippians 4 6. In Philippians 4 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing. Actually, that's not a strong translation. Badly, translation is better. Entertain no worry. In fact, the late Dr. Dewey Pentecost, the 21st century scholar, who was a, a professor of my beloved uh, brother here, Bruce, a, a man who, who we love dear, I think he nailed it. He said, he, that be anxious for nothing, he brought it, the picture clear. He said, do not, under any circumstance, worry about anything. He is the one that learned it very well. Do not, under any circumstance, in other words, there is no circle, there is no reason good enough to worry. Yeah. Yeah. He said, well, sis, you don't understand my situation. <laughs> That's not good enough. Not good enough reason to worry. It's not, there's no, no reason that is enough reason to break God's law. Yeah. He said, do not, under any circumstance, worry about anything. When you worry, you, in essence, you are saying, God cannot handle this one. I have seen God do my things, but this is the one that he, <laughs> this one, God, I have seen you, I know you are mighty, but this one is over you. <laughs> that's, what, that's exactly what you are telling him. God, I have seen you pay my bills, <laughs> but uh, I just received a, a note that I don't think you can handle. That's what worry. That's exactly. He didn't, he didn't say it out loud, but that's exactly what you are thinking. You don't have to say it out loud. Your action will express what you are thinking. Do not, under any circumstance, worry about anything. Self induced suffering, what's the solution? If the suffering that you are going through is manufactured by you or by you, what's the solution of course? The solution is God's grace. First John 1 9. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins to God, God is faithful and righteous. To forgive our sins, those sins that have taken you out of his plan. You approach his throne and you see, first John 1 9 is for believers, not for unbelievers. Often we use it when we go to witness to unbelievers, we tell them, confess your sin. That's wrong. Unbelievers don't confess their sins to be saved. They believe in Christ to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. It's when we are saved that we confess our sins after we fail. John says to his his audience, if you confess your sin to God, He is faithful and just, He will forgive you those sins you have confessed, and then He will go a step further. He will cleanse you from all other sins you have forgotten. And now, we have to do what Proverbs says we must do. Not just you stay well one place and confess your sin, and you stay that place. I just confess my sin. I'm enjoying this food here. Father, I, I know I need this food. Father, he told me not to eat that food. Okay. I, I have, I'm confessing that I ate the food. And it's still there. <laughs> Father, I ate the food again. You confess your food. You're not going further in the spiritual life. You have to walk out. 
the prodigal son did not stay where he was. When he remembered his state, he remembered his condition, he remembered his suffering, there's something he did. He said, I must go home. He left, he left his dungeon and returned home. Proverbs 28, verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. In Proverbs 28, verse 13, it says, He who conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Experiencing peace in the midst of storm. Pastor Bruce, my beloved, mentioned. Paul, he outlined his resume last night for us. Paul was not whining, he was not complaining. Why? Have you ever read the scripture and say, Why? This person is not didn't come ready made. He just like us with flesh and blood. And why did he, why was he successful in his spiritual life? Why did he go through this and yet he was not mine as a God, why me, why me syndrome? Why? He wasn't complaining because he had discovered the secret, so to say, of Suffering through the way of suffering with great peace and joy that only comes from the Holy Spirit. Paul was beaten and jailed. He had no peace. In Acts 16 verse 23, Paul was beaten, Roman style, and jailed. In verse 23, in verse 31, and in verse 25, he was singing melody to God. Why was he singing? Because he had peace. He had joy. The joy combined with the peace prompted him to give thanks to the Father and to praise him in all things. In all things, give thanks to God, for this is the will of God concerning you. And Paul was fulfilling that. He was giving thanks to God, even though he was bleeding. Because he knew God was a judge. Not the Romans, but God. The Romans broke the law. As a Roman citizen, they was against the law to whip a Roman citizen before hearing his case. But they already broke the law. Paul knew that. He didn't whine in the prison. These Roman people, they will find that tomorrow they will see you that they have broken the law. No, he knew that he was there for God's glory. And he knew that the people were also watching him because he was the fifth gospel. The apostle Paul was the fifth gospel. And so he used his life to display Christ for God's glory, even in suffering. God's word, the source of peace in the storm of life. God's word, the storm of the source of peace in the storm of life. I'm going to take you to break in the next ten minutes. God's word, the source of peace the stuff of life. Paul, in, in, in Acts 27, verse 23, Paul was in a storm. It was a big storm. Shipwreck. We know the story. But God came and told Paul, the Lord told him, you will not perish. You will not perish. That's God's word. If you read the rest of the verses from verse 
that's the one to thirty five, you see the end Paul to courage because of the war. How many of you have tried to eat your dinner when you have, your house is burning? Anyone? Eat dinner when your house is on fire. When Paul had his lunch, when the storm was lowering, he ate his bread. Not only did he eat his bread, he gave thanks to God. <laughs> this is, we seen everything falling apart. The boat is falling apart. And you took bread and said, God, thank you for this bread. That's a man who believed God. Amen. That's a man who believed the word of God. Heaven shall pass away, but my word will not pass away. Whatever God says he will do, he will do, no matter what. If God says he will take care of you, God will take care of you. If he says he will provide for you in this life, God will make that provision. So if you believe that, in the midst of suffering, you should be calm. You should relax, knowing that the one who promised you is faithful. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for your love and your kindness. Thank you because you have a plan for each and every one of us. We know that our problems are not bigger than you are going to be put them. Father, you know who we are and how feeble we are as human beings. Father, we know that you have brought us here from all walks of life to minister to us. My prayer, Father, you've done this in the past. My prayer is simple. That as we came here, that we will not go home the same. That if your word will impact our lives and change us within, that we will begin to see suffering as something you have a handle on. That we will begin to see suffering as something, something that not only do you have a handle on it, often you decide it for our blessing. Count it joy when you encounter various trials. But I will pray for everyone here that is hurting. That you minister to us, you are the God of comfort. That you comfort us with your word. That we will be able to comfort others with the same comfort you have comforted us with. Father, we pray that you will bless us immensely this weekend. We lift our prayer in Christ's name.